Welcome back, everybody, to Post Wrestling. It's John Pollock here with you, and a pleasure to be joined by this man, a, a noted author in the combat sports space. You know him from titles such as Total MMA, Shooters, the Toughest Men in Professional Wrestling, and the MMA Encyclopedia, something that I have two feet from me. And uh, joining my book space now is Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man, uh, Jonathan Snowden is with us here on Post Wrestling. Jonathan, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on the Shamrock release, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So tell me kind of how this has differed from other past releases for you, because it seems this one has come out of the gate with just so much praise, and it, has this one been different from past releases? Is it similar? How would you compare the, the reception this early uh, to the Shamrock release versus your other books? Wow, it's so uh, everything about this is is very different. This has been an experiment and a learning process for me. Uh, this is the first book I've done kind of on my own. Uh, all my other books were published through ECW Press. And so from the very beginning, uh, everything about this has been <laughs> has been very, very different than my past experiences. Uh, but but you're right that the, the response to this book has been overwhelming, like just uh, the, so much positivity and, and so many people reaching out and, and, and talking about how much they enjoyed the book. Um, I, I've always I mean, not to toot my own horn, but, you know, I've, I've always had pretty decent uh, response to, to my work, uh, especially the, in, in the book space. But nothing like this. I mean, it, it really has kind of uh, overwhelmed me. And it's I, I, I just I, I feel uh, so humbled and, and, and grateful for, for people taking the time out of their day to reach out and say, hey, the, this this book moved me. This might sound silly, but I think like there's there's a real uh, substance to it. And you know, I've talked to many wrestlers in the past about what it means to, you know, get a a positive, you know, whether it's like an award in the observers, a five star match, like that's a real thing, especially for talent on the way up to get that kind of uh, notoriety and that kind of bump from Dave Meltzer. And he's been very, very, um, he has thrown a lot of praise at this book. Um, is that something that, you know, you have seen firsthand that, you know, Dave reaches a lot of people and getting that recommendation has uh, helped the momentum of this book. Uh, I think it's reached a lot of people through that. I think there's no doubt about it that, that in the, the professional wrestling space, there's no bigger uh, influencer than Dave Meltzer. Whether or not he has the biggest platform or not, it, I don't think that that really matters. The fact is when he speaks, um, his audience listens. And so it definitely has meant a lot to, to this book. And frankly, uh, I don't think I'd be here um, without Dave Meltzer and his response to my first book, Total MMA. Um, Which is an excellent, book excellent book. book if people um, want to learn about the history of, of MMA. I, I can't recommend that book uh, enough. I really love that book that you put out. at this. What, what are we saying, 12 years ago? Oh man, yeah, and and longer than that since I first started writing it. But right. you know, you you wouldn't have known about that book, and no one would have really uh, without Dave uh, being an enthusiastic early reader. And so, um, you know, I, I understand, <laughs> I, I understand real well uh, how much it means to have his support. And so, uh, I, I felt it was tremendous that that he even read the book, and that uh, it seemed like he was talking about it for days. And and uh, you can literally see the the spike in sales uh, from the day he started talking about it. So um, yeah, I, I owe a lot to Dave, no doubt. I really appreciated how uh, candid you were in, in the book, particularly at the end where you talked about your own reservations of even going into this project. Like it was a case of kind of, of Ken pitching it to you, which I would imagine as the author of this book, I mean, that does give you somewhat that you're not, pursuing the subject they're pursuing you and that gave you i think the kind of the agency to put this book out in your vision how you would like it to because you know a, a lot of you know relationships from author and subject it can be very much one-sided in terms of who's relying on who and t for this story to be told you needed to have that power that you know the gloves would be off we're going to tell the ken shamrock story which has been told many times but never in this depth and that was I think your own reservations about what what can we add to the Ken Shamrock story, you ended up finding out quite a lot. Yeah, so there's there's no way I would have uh, done the book in any other way. Um, I you know it had been eight years I think since Shooters came out, something like that, and and I had kind of resigned myself to the idea that I might not write another book, and so um, 
I, I wasn't going to say yes just because a project was thrown to me. You know, I, I, I've had lots of other offers uh, to do books and, and I even started another book that I kind of quit on in the middle. And so um, I, I knew it had to be something that that was important to me. Uh, for me to to succeed at it and and writing like a, a a glamorized kind of like told to autobiography um w- would not have been it like i i wanted to tell a, a real story and write a real book and that was um so i i think that that's something that you don't see a lot anymore in in the wrestling space you know there's um from it started with Mick Foley and it's kind of been downhill from there and 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 I wanted to get back to that kind of authenticity that Mick brought to the space, and um, I, I hope that we we did a good job of that. Do you think that that's something that that's being lost on a? It, it's a grander scale, but it, it certainly was the discussion point with, with the Last Dance, and that you know without Michael Jordan's company involved, this thing doesn't see the light of day. And the final product, like it's it's a tremendous series. Uh, the debate of you know. Is, is that the best way to go about things? But that's kind of where, you know, the documentary space is kind of going, Jonathan. Like even, you know, yesterday ESPN announces this new deal with Tom Brady for a nine part documentary series, but it's being done in conjunction with his production company. And that kind of seems to be the kind of the, the line that is being straddled here between, you know, you need the involvement of these people, but you're giving up like somewhat creative control in that sense. And it seemed like you were able to separate that very distinctly here because you, you were able to establish those rules from the get go with Ken. Yeah. It's a very interesting time to be a journalist or a documentarian or, or a historian. I, I think that social media has, has created a, a brand new uh, playing field where uh, an athlete like Tom Brady or Michael Jordan or, or even Ken Shamrock doesn't, they don't strictly need a media person to, to help them tell their story. Um, they, they have their own avenues now to do that. And so it's, it's made it a, a big challenge. So I, I, I really enjoyed the, the last dance. I, w- I watched it every Sunday night, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it's like uh, kind of like one of those WWE documentaries on the WWE network where I can enjoy watching it. But I also know that, you know, there's a lot not being told in those stories because of their, they have the final cut. And I'm sure that's true of Michael Jordan and it's true of Tom Brady. And, and it, it's true. Even when I try to write like uh, feature stories for Bleacher Report, um, there's kind of like an unwritten rule that, um, you know, you, you know, you can only venture into certain territory if you, if you want to do these kind of stories, you know, that that's just how the game works now. And for whatever reason, I was able to kind of uh, work outside the, this new paradigm with, with Ken. And uh, I'm really grateful for it. I don't think the, the book would have been the same had it, you know, if I had to push it through him, the final product, it would not look like it does not, uh, today. I don't think. Did, did that ever waver throughout this whole process more so from, from Ken's point of view um, knowing, you know, and kind of what was his motivation to get that, that story out there? Because this is, this is hardly, um, a book that you're, I, I think people will come away, um, with many different opinions of Ken, some positive, but, uh, there's a lot of negative stories here about, about Ken. Like this is, everything's out there for you to assess this individual through all of his faults. And he kind of lays himself bare in this book. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it was the 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 right time to to do it in in his life because he had just uh, finished the the Hoist Gracie fight and he didn't he wasn't really in a, in the public space at at the moment and so I think that kind of uh, lent itself uh, to him being really candid and and allowing the people in his circle to speak to me candidly which was equally as important. Um, had I approached him or he approached me about this book today. Uh, it'd probably be different because he's wrestling again. He's on television. He has an image to think about. Uh, I, we just happened to hit at a moment where that wasn't paramount in his mind. He, he wasn't, he didn't have anything to protect. He wasn't selling anything. And so um, uh, timing is everything. And I think the timing was perfect for, for this book uh, and for Ken to, um, to be as candid as he was, uh, was partly because, uh, I guess he didn't feel like he was protecting a reputation or selling a pay-per-view or anything like that. He, he was able to just relax for a minute and, and, and tell his real story, which I think was, was important to him. So you conducted over a hundred interviews for this book. Oh, I mean, it was insane. Uh, I, I'm not sure 
<laughs> if I do it again or why I did it. But, um, you know, once I was into it, it's just like uh, my thought process was like, if, if, if we're going to do this, let's let's do it. Let's do it right. Let's do it thoroughly. And um, and maybe it was overkill. But uh, I, I think almost everyone I talked to contributed an insight that was important. And so uh, I think uh, I'm glad I did it this way. Oh, I'm I'm definitely not uh, disagreeing with the way you went about it. This was uh, super thorough. My uh, question would be about how you would uh, when when it's such a high volume uh, of interviews. I, I just heard this interview with, with Greg Oliver, uh, and he spoke about when he's doing an interview. He says that if my interviews go longer than twenty minutes, I'm not doing my job. Everything that needs to be said should be in that first twenty minutes, and that's an interesting way to go about interviews. I, I can't say that I can hold myself to to that uh, format, <laughs> but I'm just kind of curious. Like when you, you know, time is a is a big thing for when you're, you know, writing this book. You have so many people to speak to. Do you go into an interview with any kind of set uh, goals of like, hey, I've got to maximize these topics, or is it you, you don't overthink when you go into these interviews? It's hey, if this is a really engaging subject, then we're just going to go, and I can't really. Listen limit myself to uh, a time constraint or, so, or such. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to say Greg's process is wrong because obviously he's produced a lot of excellent work. And so uh, it works for him and that would not work for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but mine is kind of the opposite. In fact, I found with like a lot of the pivotal interviews, uh, subjects uh, for, for the book, like I would do a, a first interview that was almost all kind of their like you've interviewed athletes and people in the business, right? So they all have their kind of pre-concocted story. Like, this is the story I tell about my life. This is the story I tell about this event. If someone asked me about Ken Shamrock, this is the story I tell. Their media interview. Um, we would all do one of those. And then I would call back and we'd do a second interview. And and that's when we'd really be able to to really delve into to kind of deeper topics. Um, so I, I think maybe I'm the opposite of, of Greg and uh, conduct multiple hour long interviews <laughs> with everyone at, at my own expense and uh, sanity when it comes to transcribing it all. Um, you know, you you're, you're probably the perfect person to delve deep into into the whole Pancras era because it's I, I would say that if you are strictly coming from it from the side of things that you're a mixed martial arts fan. I think you're going to lose a lot of what made Pancras Pancras in in Japan to that pro wrestling audience. And conversely, if you're just a pro wrestling fan, you're going to miss it as well. It's kind of that that Venn diagram that you fall right in the middle to understand it. It's and it's such a difficult promotion, I think, to really um, unearth what what is legitimate, what is not. And I thought you did a really really strong job of of navigating that territory because you're also relying on people that. You know, in the case of Boss Rutten, doesn't believe he was ever involved in any kind of worked fight. And to his knowledge, he may never have been. Uh, the other guy on the other side may or may not have. And it's just it, – it's very difficult to kind of straddle the worlds of pro wrestling and mixed martial arts. And that that is the example of, of Pancrase. Yeah, I think um, this was the third time I had gotten a shot at um... – at writing about it <laughs> between total MMA and shooters and now this. And so finally, you know, I, I, I came close with my swing on, on the other two attempts, but I, I didn't strike out. I think, I think I finally uh, had the opportunity a third time and, and, and I actually nailed it. And so I, I was really happy about that. But um, that was one of the interesting things that Dave said to me uh, in, in correspondence was like, um, you know, there's very few people that he thought could have written about this and not been worked and fooled and, and gotten it wrong uh, because it is complicated. And, and um, luckily, I'm I'm just the kind of weirdo who has spent a lifetime studying this stuff and watching it all. And so um, I, I was kind of like the perfect person, I think, to, to write about uh, shoot style wrestling and the development of MMA. Uh, I've been thinking about it for most of my life. Um how would you how would you classify the the relationship today between uh Ken and Frank Shamrock who i mean you explain in the book was kind of on board and then he quickly was not on board yeah it was i i would well you know you'd have to ask them because it's um it's a relationship that that uh fluctuates a lot like mm -hmm. you know it, it it's been really really bad and then there was a time where 
they were sort of working together to maybe promote this pay-per-view fight. And then that fell apart and then it got bad again. And then they worked together to do a, a special for Spike television on, on Frank's life where, you know, the, one of the highlights was the two of them sitting down and having it out. And then, you know, just a couple of years ago, they, they were doing like speaking tours where Frank and, and Ken and Guy Metzger would, would talk to an audience, kind of like something you would see at StarCast or something. Um, so it, it has its ups and downs. Uh, when I was trying to interview him for the book, it was definitely uh, in a down period. And, and I think, uh, I don't know if I was the cause of that or a victim of it. Uh, I, I'm not really sure. So um, where it stands today, I think you'd have to ask them. Uh, one, one thing with Ken is that, you know, it's, once you get to 1997, it's an interesting fork in the road for Ken when he sees that, you know, to, to maintain this lifestyle, it's got to be outside of mixed martial arts. And by that, it's UFC at that point for him. And he's, he's staring at the offers from WWF and New Japan Pro Wrestling. As someone that was following both at the time, Jonathan, like he chooses that New Japan route. Do you see this being like a dramatically different path for Ken? Or do you think that ultimately it's just, largely lands the same way for Ken because it's that WWF period that brings him a ton of notoriety. But as you document in some pretty excruciating detail, it's a, it's a party scene that is insane. I can't even describe it more than that. And this guy was probably at the top level of the people that were abusing themselves during that, that period on the road. Yeah, it was pretty amazing uh, not to segue, but uh, to have all these uh, WWF wrestlers who, have seen it all when it comes to, to drugs and debauchery. Tell me like, Oh yeah, it's Ken Shamrock was really bad. It's like when some of these people are telling you that like someone else is bad into drugs, like, uh, you know, it must be pretty extreme, but um, I, I don't know that we would, I think Ken would, it would have been great to see Ken in, in that role um, in new Japan pro wrestling at the same time. Uh, I don't know that we'd be having this conversation or, or how much people would think about Ken Shamrock, because I think that it was his run in WWF at, at a time when it was uh, in front of 6 million people every Monday night that, um, that made him an enduring figure that led to this second run in, in UFC and pride and, and beyond. Um, I, I think that without that, um, He's just, you know, one of these uh, forgotten pioneers that nobody talks about anymore. You know, um, it, would be, it would be is, interesting. Is, the the launch of Pride in '97 with Ken attached to New Japan at that time, if that become if he kind of becomes one of their their early stars of, of the Pride era. But I think ultimately, you look at you know what he did at, on the other side of the world, and he would go to Pride. But it was. Um, I, I guess, you know, so many interesting what, what ifs as well with, with Ken and, you know, d different directions that he went throughout his career. Yeah, I, but, you know, when when you think about it, that when, at least when people talk to me about Ken, I think that there's so many people that, that know about him because of WWF. And he was only there for, for two years. So it's yeah. kind of crazy when you think about it, considering the, the breadth and length of his career. But, I mean, th those are the big years. Um like he was telling me, like, you know, you have a certain level of fame when you're in early UFC, you're in like, as he put it, karate magazines, a uh, whole different level once you hit Monday Night Raw and, and you're pushed there. Uh, you know, he's like, then I was recognized everywhere I went for, for the rest of my life. So it, it, it definitely is a, a big difference. And I think that uh, without WWF, we wouldn't have seen uh, him certainly not fighting into his 50s and being on uh, Bellator and still drawing a huge audience, <laughs> you know, uh, way, well into what should have been his retirement years. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, to me, like, you will come away with this, you know, you'll you'll see that this is a guy that absolutely pushed himself to these extreme limits, both in and, and outside of the of the fighting arena. But I mean, so often you will get, you know, fighters and wrestlers that will greatly exaggerate their influence, their drawing power. With Ken, it's really not an exaggeration when you look at what he did in, in the 90s with the UFC, then coming back. You know, literally that the fight, the first fight with Tito Ortiz is among the most important fights in MMA history. Like if that, if UFC 40 doesn't happen, it, it's a great what if of what happens with the UFC after that, if, if not for that fight. And then, taking the company to unprecedented pay-per-view levels in 2006. And then we're talking about the Bellator years where it's, 
it's you can understand like this drug that he is chasing because the people are not turning away from him when he's placed in these big spotlights. Like there is still an audience that I would say under the right circumstances that Ken fighting in a in a big promotion today there would be an audience for. I can't even discount that now in 2020. Yeah, it's hard to really, um, you, you try to understand why, uh, at least I did. Like, uh, I understand the initial appeal of Ken Shamrock. You know, he looks like a, a real life superhero. Uh, uh, he was a good pro wrestler, you know, uh, but at some point it's like, why do these people still care? Uh, and, and I can't really tell you why, but all I can tell you is that they did. Uh, you know, right up to the very end, he, they were setting records on on for television viewership for Bellator. So, what whatever Ken has, in, at least in the with the MMA audience, it wasn't something that that went away. And, and I think you're you're absolutely right that like if he stepped back in um, for one of these bare knuckle fights that he's promoting now or, or something like that, there would still be an interest there because for whatever reason. Uh, he's just one of these figures that people care about. And w- and once they care about you um, to a certain degree, they're not going to stop. So he's like one of these people that like his fans have deep in their hearts and, and that's ne- never going to go away. Is that kind of one of the, the cruel realities of, of the fight industry that in order for a lot of these guys to finally come to grips with their careers being over, it almost takes that extreme that the audience that once loved you has to not care about you. Like, unless you have life after fighting figured out, which is a small percentage, or you've made a, an, a, an, a number that you can move away from fighting, again, a small percentage, you're going to stay too long, and you've got to wait until the audience is no longer caring about you like they once did. Like, that, it's a pretty harsh reality that these fighters have to face at the end, and with Ken, it's, you know, that, that audience has not turned away yet. Um, yeah, I don't really... Uh... Ken is an interesting one because that, that never really happened. And so that, partially that's why he kept fighting. The other reason, of course, is that they, they desperately needed the money and he didn't know uh, what else to do or what else he could do to, to put himself in the income bracket that he was kind of used to being in. Uh, and, and so he continued to fight like well after he had all these health problems and, you know, his body is telling him not to fight. His family is telling him not to fight. But there's, uh, you know, the audience isn't telling him. And so, yeah, he, he really did just continue going out there. And, and finally, I think his family had to draw a hard line for him uh, because the audience never really did. He never hit that bottom uh, where, where, you know, promoters would say, Hey, it's not worth it. Um, th- they just never stopped coming. Yeah. And, and the tax problems. I mean, that, that is a recurring theme throughout the, the whole book of like this, this burden that this guy has. And it just seems like it was, you know, bad choices made, trusting in people around him. And it's, you know, an enormous figure that just seems to be a cloud over this guy's head that has been a significant period of his life is just fighting from underneath uh, of these tax burdens. Like, it really is a lesson in terms of fighters that are coming into money in, in great supply and what and how best to handle your financial situation because it, it's a real un- unfortunate burden. And th- that seems to be, you know, above all else, like a motivating factor in all of this. It's very difficult because, you know, Ken is certainly not alone in this. Like, you know, there was a a special on ESPN, I think called broke where, uh, you know, they talk about how many athletes in, in, you know, regular sports uh, lose all their money, like shortly after their, it stops coming in. Um, and, And because like Ken, like a lot of times professional athletes are people who come from, um, kind of, um, unfortunate circumstances. So, you know, they're, they don't have anyone in their lives who, who know how to, how to handle this kind of wealth. And, and so they make bad decisions or, or they turn, they, they, they turn responsibility over to the, the exact kind of people that they shouldn't trust. And it's, so it's a, it, it's very hard and it was certainly hard for, for him. Um, and, and it, and it really did drive him to continue fighting when, when he knew he shouldn't be, his wife knew he shouldn't be, his family and friends uh, had given up on watching him fight because it was too depressing. And, and he's still out there because the, the tax bill uh, never went away. It's as we fast forward to, to present day and, and he's featured on Impact Wrestling and, you know, you kind of get a sense of where he is at this point in his life. And it's very much presented on television. Like here is this legendary figure and he's turning back the clock and you know, as as fans, do you look at it that 
that's almost like part of the problem that there still is this appeal for him because I think you come out of this book and you're you're somewhat conflicted about watching this guy at this point at 56, the heart problems he's undergone. Um, I don't know what, what what the question necessarily is, but are you like, do you come out of this with like kind of that that conflict of watching Ken still push himself to certain limits, even though it's it's in a worked environment now with, with impact? Yeah, I, I I struggle with it a lot um, to the point where um, people ask me about it, but you know I I, I don't watch it. Um, I don't know. It, it feels uncomfortable for for me. I, you know, I don't feel like I should say whether he should or shouldn't do it, or whether they should employ him or not. Um, I, I don't necessarily like watching it, and, and partly because you know I've seen the clips and from the very beginning, like he he's still the Ken Shamrock, and so you know the idea of him going out there and taking it easy because he's an older guy and he's a legend and he probably frankly could take it easy. Um, that doesn't exist in, in his mind. You know, that's not how he became who he is. And so he's immediately doing these crazy dives out of the ring and taking all these uh, incredible risks. And it, it, it is, uh, it, it is hard to, to bear witness to it <laughs> for sure. Uh, just a few more questions. Like you got to speak to kind of all the principals in, involved in, in the lion's den, you know, speaking with, with all those different people from Vernon White to Guy Mesger, Jerry Bolander. Do you come away with it that this is still this very, like they're all kind of woven by this bond that was the lion's den in those early years? Um, or is there almost like, what, what is their, um, opinion of Ken in like an overall sense, like was he was this tyrant, but at the same time, he seemed to be like this leader that they would take a bullet for at, at the same time. And it seemed that there were um, a range of emotions that they had with Ken throughout their careers. Yeah, it's a, it's very mixed. And I think that it's uh, not only is it mixed like between different guys, like and how they feel about Ken, it's mixed with the same guy and how he, he feels during different conversations or, you know, um, depending on what you ask him about. Uh, definitely, uh, Ken was a monumental figure in all of their lives. That's for sure. I don't think anybody would, would dispute that. Um, how they feel about it really differs dramatically be- between the guys. I think there's a, there's some of them who feel like, wow, I was kind of caught up in a cult for a little bit there in my 20s who kind of have that viewpoint. And then there's others who are like, yeah, like um, there's like fighters that you haven't really heard of, like Matt Roca, who is a guy that was there for like a a year and a half and he had one fight in in Australia. And now he's a police officer and he's like, I I wouldn't be the person I am. I wouldn't know how to deal with conflict or, uh, you know, uh, how to handle adverse situations if I hadn't spent this time with with Ken. And so it it, it really just depends on on the person. But um, there's no doubt that if you were there, like it was that was what your life was. And so definitely there's no one who who's ambivalent about it. (laughs) They they, they have strong feelings one way or the, the other about Ken. Uh, with, with the project out now and, and many people uh, reading the book, um, do you get any sense if Ken has read the book or any uh, reaction he has had to the book? Um, for, for sure, he's read the book. Um, he, he's starting to, to do some some interviews, I guess. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to, to hear any of them. Um, I, I think he's mostly pleased with it. Uh, I think he does have some... Um, you know, some second, some se- some second thoughts about like, should he have been so open? Should he have put so much control in my hands? Um, you know, it, it's it's his story, but yet it's not his story because there are so many other perspectives. Um, it, to to be honest with you, he sent me a, a, a list of his grievances. I guess I would call them, and they're they're for the most part uh, uh, kind of minor and like differences of opinion with what other people said in interviews and, and, you know, not, not uh, about facts or, or things like that and not about any of the big revelations. And so um, his response has been interesting, you know, in, in my experience in my life as a writer, I, I've never really maintained relationships or, or attempted to with people that I've profiled uh, mm-hmm. for Bleacher or elsewhere. Um, so have, you know, being in contact with someone after, a work like this comes out is kind of new, new to me. So it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to navigate and see, uh, you know, what, what our, what our relationship is now that we have the thing we've been working on together uh, in a sense is out there for the world to see uh, what happens next is, is going to be a new adventure. 
Uh, and in, in terms of uh, what's next, what can you say about uh, Hybrid Shoot? Again, you mentioned like you, you put this out on your own and the idea of doing kind of a, a biographical project in the future. Is that something that you would, with the right subject, uh, jump headfirst into or would you like to tell larger stories? What, what do you – and is the idea of even writing a book right now even something you want to even uh, look at after – I'm sure this was an, a very exhaustive one for you. Yeah, I mean, this was a three-year project, but I'm I'm actually excited to continue into to, to new projects and and new ideas. I've um, fielded a lot of interest, I guess, from fighters and wrestlers uh, who have seen the either read or, or heard about the Shamrock book or, and are are interested in me helping them tell their story in some form. So there there are opportunities out there. And then maybe it's a maybe I'd rather go a different direction and, and explore uh, broader topics, like you say, like wrestling as art and, and things of this nature. Um, and and Hybrid Shoot also has uh, some books that are uh, are not by me, like Matt Charlton has a, an illustrated guide to the champions of Japanese wrestling called J Crowned, and we're going to have a book, uh, an illustrated book coming out about the the 100 uh, greatest bloodiest matches in wrestling history uh, by um, Phil Schneider, who is like a, a a pioneer of like online wrestling writer writing with the death Valley driver uh, message board. And so uh, we, we've got some other stuff coming, but um, a photo book by Ryan Loco, the great MMA and wrestling photographer. So there, there's a lot on our plate, but um, I, I think for sure I, I'll jump immediately back into something as soon as the right thing comes along. And I'll, I think I'll know it when I hear it, you know, it'll be something that like sings to me and I'm like, Oh yeah, that that's the one. So uh, I'll let you guys know. <laughs> Last question in 2020, what is Jonathan Stone's relationship with mixed martial arts? How would you classify it as someone that has followed it all, most of your life? Um, you know, the modern day mixed martial arts, is it something that you're consuming a lot of a little of, um, I know you're doing a lot in professional wrestling as well. Uh, but wh- how would you uh, classify, uh, how much you follow MMA today? So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So last year I moved, um, after 10 years or more as an MMA writer, I moved to the pro wrestling beat. Um, and so uh, I don't cover MMA much professionally anymore. And, and so, um, that kind of has changed my relationship with it. Um, I'm still a fan. I still watch all the big events. Uh, I think I probably watch at least the main card of, of, of every UFC event. Um, I don't feel as compelled to, to track the everyday kind of going, goings on, like who's, beefing with who on Twitter and what, what fight's going to be made. And then it falls apart. Like I'm definitely a fan now where it's like uh, uh, when it's on Saturday night, um, I'll know it's real. I'm not so worried about it until it's on my screen. And so it, it's interesting. I, I definitely preferred, I think as a fan, the the era that Ken was a fighter in where it was kind of more visceral and raw and um, more resembling like what you might actually see in a, in a fight uh, today, the, the athletes are obviously superior technicians and, and MMA is a much more professional space. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that suits me as well as a fan. I kind of like the, the underground spirit of the, the old days. And so um, maybe that's just because I'm getting old and, you know, we're all like, oh, back in my day. But I'm definitely a, I'm definitely in a back in my day headspace. I'll say that. Well, uh, Jonathan, uh, congratulations on the book. Again, it's Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man. Uh, it's available everywhere uh, through Hybrid Shoot. You can find it on Amazon, wherever books are sold, which I guess is mainly in the digital space right now. I don't know how many bookstores are open right now, but uh, uh, I-, I definitely recommend the book. It was one that uh, I-, I sat down to-, to start reading this, Jonathan, and suddenly I was like 115 pages in on like one sitting. I was just uh, <laughs> really jumped into it. It was a really uh, fantastic insight on a subject that like, like, I felt felt I knew like a good amount of, but learned so much uh, reading this book. So um, do go out of your way uh, to check this one out. And all the best of success uh, moving forward, Jonathan. Uh, it was great to chat with you. Thanks so much for uh, giving us some time today. Of course, man. I really appreciate you saying that. Thanks. Thanks again for having me.